Oh my God, what a whirlwind of craziness and awesomeness. <laughs> um, it was it was awesome, you know. It was it's it was really cool on so many different levels. Um, the first was just getting to know Humphrey's music better because I've been friends with them for for like twenty years, you know, just just doing festivals together and everything, but um, never really paid attention to their music too much. It seems like every time I would listen to them, it was one of their super proggy uh, songs, and I thought they were all like that. Um, and so when they asked me to do this, I'm like, oh my God, I have to do four shows of just like straight prog metal, you know, and different time signatures. Um, but they're a band with many different personalities. And, um, uh, you know, so they sent me a lot of songs and I said, oh, wow, you know, this is different than what I thought it was. I can, I can definitely add my own thing here. Um, and, you know, and it was a challenge with the number of songs they wanted me to do four shows without any repeats and that originally it was just one set per night and then two days one day before I left uh Brendan asked if I can do most of the first set also and just sent me a whole bunch of songs um and you know he, he was he was cool about it he, he said you know don't worry if uh, if it's too much just do what you can and everything but I just charted everything on the plane and went there and knocked out the four shows and uh yeah it, it was great yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> I love it I love it. So starting this off, man, like what have been some of your biggest challenges behind the scenes for you as an artist? The biggest challenge definitely is having a family and being on the road a lot. Um, you know, so trying to balance uh, family life and everything. You know, my wife, um, she used to work part time and now she's working uh, mainly full time now. So, so when I'm gone, she, she has a lot on her plate and everything. So, you know, we're just, we're just trying to, to find ways around that, you know, so that's, that's number one biggest challenge of it all right now. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> How did, does that have like a creative impact on you? Um, yeah, I think it does. Just because when I am home, there's so much to do, especially I, you know, it's, I, you know, I have a lot more going on besides the family. And, and you know, I do a lot of real estate sort of things. And, uh, you know, just between I just have a lot of uh, different uh, ventures here that are pulling me in, in different directions at all times. And sometimes I wish that I could just do music and be home and, you know, play drums for four or five hours a day and, and have that be a real focus. But, uh, as of right now, my life is just <laughs> pretty crazy. And so, so, you know, I, I, hopefully in a year or two, things will be calming down and I can start focusing, uh, back on, on one or two things instead of 5,000 different things. But, uh, you know, it's it's uh, everyone has a struggle, especially if they have a family with with young children. It's it's a lot. So yeah. I yeah, I can't even imagine. Oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> what would you say is most important for you with how you actually define success for yourself? Um, I think I've always been realistic about it, and I never had any dreams of. Uh, driving gold-plated Mercedes and, you know, having a 50,000 square foot house, you know, for me, it was, it was more just being able to make a living by playing music, um, having people in a small group who understood what I was doing, respect what I was doing. You know, I didn't have to be known by, by a million people. Um, you know, it's, it's more, uh, like, you know, kind of similar to what the situation I'm in, I'm in now, you know, if I go to a Lotus show, people know who I am. But the second I step out of that room, no one knows me. Um, and and I think that's that's awesome. Uh, so, you know, to so to be doing that, uh, to play the venues that I played and met the people that I played, um, you know, I consider that to be successful, you know, for my definition of it. So now with where you're at, like, what would you define as success going forward? <clears throat> um, maintaining what we have. Uh, the music industry the last couple years has been struggling a lot. Um, unless if you're Goose or Fish or the Grateful Dead, I guess, especially in the jam band community. But pretty much every festival that I've been at the last two years, have they've been undersold. Um, so 
you know, it's, it's a struggle right now. So, you know, for me, just, you know, keeping what we had going and, and, and maintaining that for me right now would, would be, uh, I think successful given the challenges that are happening in the, uh, in the environment. So, um, you know, that I'd like to, you know, what's cool, you know, just personally, um, as a drummer, I just still like to keep growing. I think who I am as a drummer now is different than who I was five years ago. And uh, I'd like to see the next five years to to be developing even more. Um, so, you know, on a personal level to, to, to keep doing that. So, you know, pretty, pretty simple uh, aspirations, but uh, that's what I got. <laughs> so in the worlds of music, like, there's so many different ways to to look at music. And I'm I'm curious with you, musically speaking, would you say you have any contrary views uh compared to like most musicians about about how you look at music? Um I I'm not sure. I think I, I have a pretty open mind when it comes to a lot of different styles and I, I'm pretty fair where if I hear music that I think is well done, even if it's not to my taste at all, I can really respect it and get behind it. Um, even something like, you know, like my my daughters love Taylor Swift, you know, and like I I couldn't even name one Taylor Swift song two years ago and now I'm in, immersed in it. Um, I would never choose to go to a Taylor Smith uh Taylor Swift concert on my own. Um, I, I would never choose to put her on the radio, but I'm listening to it all the time. And um, it's very well-crafted pop songs, you know, and, and I respect what she's doing, you know? So maybe where I can say, you know, wow, I really respect what she's doing. Maybe if you have someone who's like, you know, coming from a, like a hardcore jam scene and, and looking at her and like, that's pop, man, that's, that's horrible. But, you know, I think I can, I can appreciate that for what it is also. So, Maybe that, but you know, uh, you know, I'm not too sure. Besides my broad range, uh, what would be really contrarian about it? So, like you've you've had a you've been at this for a while, and yeah. you know, in those times where you're not so fired up about drumming and performing, and how do you how do you stay stoked about about music and about drumming, especially like when you can kind of feel like burnout maybe creeping in. Yeah. Um, I think I could always look back to the, just a few years ago during the pandemic when I had to take, I was forced to take a year and a half off and couldn't play. And all of a sudden, you know, coming back all the things that maybe I was complaining about before now is just psyched about it, you know, like, you know, okay, yeah, I have to hop on a plane, but I'm going to hop on a plane and go play a show. And I couldn't just do that three years ago. Um, so, you know, just putting things in perspective and putting that mm. in order, I think really, really helps out doing it. And like, you know, honestly, I don't really get, find myself getting too burnt out of things, um, with Lotus and my schedule, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty nice that we have a lot of time off, um, right now, uh, the last Lotus show was, um, labor day weekend and our next show isn't until next weekend you know so it's it's what the, the three weeks off you know so I, I get i get a decent amount of downtime where i can either explore other music projects or just like take care of things around the house and just be a normal person again um i think where it would be challenging would be like these guys that do worldwide tours and they're out for like a year and a half like i, I don't think i could ever do that um the longest tours i've ever done are less than two months and and towards the end of that, I start really <laughs> not liking being there. There's a sweet spot of touring. Maybe it's around like four or five weeks where you're like really dialed in, the band's dialed in. And then after that, things just start going downhill a little bit. I think where people just kind of start getting sick of each other and they just want to get off the road. Um, so, uh, but luckily, you know, I'm not really in a position. We don't really tour out of the United States. So it's, you know, we couldn't even do it that long if we wanted to. So yeah, I don't really find myself in that situation too much, honestly. What about with your ears getting tired? Um, they do a little bit, you know, when, when we do, a, if we do a five week tour and I come home, the last thing I want to do is, is listen to music right away. You know, so that's when I'll listen to podcasts or, or, you know, just, you know, give music a little bit of a break. 
Um, or even just, it, it could be as simple as listening to a very different style of music. Uh, if, if, if we're playing a lot of jam band music and I come home and I'll listen to some straight ahead jazz, or if I'm listening to classical, you know, that, that will allow my brain to accept it, um, as, as long as it's not too close in the, in the genre. Um, but, but it's nice stepping away from it so you can come back with, with fresh ears. This is Flowers on the Stage, a podcast about being creative and finding success. To support it, please check out our sponsors, New Belgium Brewing, Thrax CBD, and Ticket Relief, the ticketing company that plants trees with a portion of each ticket sold. And now, back to the episode. So I want to I talk to you next about, like, you know, your perspective on musicians that might be up and coming and what that situation's like and especially what their mind state and, and really just any musician's mind state and some things you think are are probably common misunderstandings about music itself, not necessarily like touring, but uh, about actually like people's approach to music and how you think, you know, maybe maybe there's certain common misunderstandings that that other artists have that you may have may have noticed i want to ask you about that yeah th there's a few so i see with young bands who become successful very quickly um they can take things for granted they can let their egos become unchecked um, they can get into substance abuse problems that just ruins the band uh, there. And even years down the road, you know, I was just talking with a buddy who's in a band um, and they, the band became successful very quickly when the band was young. And, and you know, some of the members don't even know how to take care of themselves. And like, they, you know, like they need someone to help them get to the airport and things like that. And um, so... You know, when, when things like that happen, I think uh, it can be challenging for people where, you know, I was kind of lucky where I didn't uh, start becoming successful as, as a musician until, you know, I was well into my 30s, you know, so I, I had time to kind of cook first um, as a person before <laughs> that was thrown at me. Um, cause I, I could understand, you know, I, I could imagine being 20 years old and, and, and all of a sudden playing in front of 5,000, 6,000 people and what that could do to you. Um, so, um, I see that, but I see the flip side of it too. I see, you know, I'm friends with a lot of the guys in goose. Um, and, it, and it's funny that you can still, I guess, kind of think of them as an upcoming band, even though they're like, <laughs> you know, they're playing in front of 10, 15,000 people in pretty much any city. But, um, even with their success, which is probably the the most explosive uh, that I've ever seen in such a short period of time, they're all such down to earth and awesome people, you know, so they didn't let that get to their heads too much, um, at least what I know about them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, you know, it, I could, I could see both sides of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's kind of what you were. Yeah, that's that's at. a way to answer that for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So with people you've worked with, managers, and also musical collaborators, can you talk to me about some of the personality traits that you most appreciate? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I found that every musician that I've worked with who is a really notable songwriter performer they have very strong personalities um and a lot of times their personalities can be so different from one another you know through the years of, of the of the performers that i've worked with but still there's that that trait of uh some commonalities for example just like work ethic um with you know with Jesse and Luke Miller, Miller you know they're just constantly working on music constantly writing um when uh you know even throughout the years you know I used to work with uh the lead singer from Dispatch uh Chad you know and and just watching yeah and, and watching him do his thing and he's he was always writing always crafting um so that was really cool and and but their personalities can be completely different 
uh, for example, with the Millers, they're very stoic in their ways. And, you know, when we're writing, when we're practicing, it's not a lot of joking around. And it's just like, you know, let's let's get to it. And we'll spend nine hours, you know, with, with you know, just like hammering out all these arrangements where, you know, if I'm working with the Disco Biscuits, it's, you know, it's a lot of jokes and a lot of fun. And maybe we'll get to some music here. But like at the end of the day, like things still come together um, and things are still put together in a, in a way that's unique to to their own personalities, you know. So it's it's really cool to see how that manifests itself uh, coming out in the songwriting um, and just into performing. But you know, yeah, it's it's like all these personalities are just so strong in in such different ways. It's 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 uh, really cool to witness. So dealing with strong personalities and you know quick fame and things like that, like. What advice can you share with other with up and coming musicians about group morale and just like being a part of a team in general and, and what it takes to like make that sustainable? Yeah, um, I think a lot of it, there, there, there are two sides of it. There's, you know, the music side and then there is the uh, the business side of it or just being professional. Um the music side for for people up and coming, I think, is to realize how difficult this industry is. And a lot of people think that they can become that they want to become a rock star so they can, uh, you know, just kind of like not work 40 hours a week and just have a great time. But like honestly, it's it the work required is is way more than 40 hours a week to get your to get a band going. So the amount of work and your work ethic has to be even stronger than someone who's working a nine to five. Um, the business side of it, I think, is also really important to, to be able to have that down, to be able to communicate with each other, uh, to be able to be a team player uh, musically and professionally, um, knowing if if there's a you know if there's a leader in a position that you need to kind of step back and support them if you're the leader you need people to support you um it's just knowing knowing your lane and and knowing your role i think in the band can help a lot um and and, and bands can exist with two leaders um you know as long as they know how to work together and and sometimes that can be really difficult um you know just being prepared it's it's funny when I was talking with with Brendan from Umfreeze, um, I said to him, I said, you know, I have a question. Like, why did you pick me, you know, to do these shows? Because I'm pretty much as like polar opposite from Chris Myers as you can get drum wise. And he said we, when he referred back to when we were in Dominican holidays, we did a little goofy side project called Omega Moves where we just did eighties covers and no one took it seriously. It was just like a fun thing. No one in the audience took it seriously. And I was really well prepared for each one of the songs. I charted them all out. I made some electronic patches on my drums to complement the songs. And he said, I knew that you were, if you were prepared for that, that you'd be prepared for these Umphrey shows. And that's why I got you the gig. And this is just like a sub gig but it could have been another band looking for to replace a drummer or to get a drummer and looking for someone that they knew was professional, even in a situation that everyone else would be blowing off. You know, so I think there's a lesson in that about just being prepared, being professional, being on time. Um, and uh, that can really help carry you through a lot of different situations. I love that. Yeah, yeah all the different leadership styles that exist. What what qualities would you use to describe your favorite like type of leader? Um wow. <clears throat> so I would think a leader that is also has that also has empathy and can understand where you're coming from, um a leader that is supportive of what you're doing, how you're bringing it, to, that they can see your value in it. And then they're not just treating you as an employee, as you know, as um, maybe not an equal if I'm not doing the songwriting, but still someone that can make a contribution and honoring that and taking uh, taking my two cents in for to make their vision come true. I, I think, you know, that could be really good. 
leading by example. You know, if I, if I, if, you know, I've been in bands where, you know, <laughs> the, the band leader can hardly function in life and everything. And it's kind of hard to make a band happen when, when you're dealing with that as well. Um, so, you know, having, having someone with their ducks in a row also in life and musically, um, respecting what I'm doing, all of that coming together, I think can make for a really good uh, partnership. Hmm. How would you describe your leadership style, even like <laughs> outside of being in a band? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny, you know, I'm I'm kind of a beta male and proud, you know, so a lot of times I, I find myself more in supportive roles as opposed to a leader. Um, you know, I, if you know, in my family, you know, I guess I'm a, I'm a leader. I was, I was kind kids, of trying you know. to get at that. Although, although, although my, you know, like, honestly, like, I just feel like I'm an associate manager, you know, and my wife <laughs> is running the show with, with the kids and everything. And I'm just trying to help her out as much as I can. Um, but, you know, we have, we, we all have our own roles um, with, with the business side of the family. You know, I kind of run that. Um, and, and she, she runs a lot more with, with, you know, the inner workings with the kids and everything like that. You know, so we, we have different roles. And uh, a lot of my business ventures outside of the band are really just like a one man show with, with what I'm doing. So it's not like I even have people under me. So I honestly don't have a lot of uh, experience being a leader in, in, in different projects, probably also because I, I only play drums. I'm not a songwriter. You know, I don't play piano or guitar or anything like that. So I was never really given that opportunity. Um, when I DJ, it's really just me, you know, so I'm, it's not like I'm a leader in that thing. Cause it's, it's just me pressing some buttons and having fun. Um, so yeah, I, like I mean, the, it's, I like the thought experiment <laughs> that we're all like accountable to be a leader, even if it's just to ourselves. Yeah. And that also yeah. like the best leaders get people to lead themselves a little bit. Sure. Sure. No, that, that's, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about something maybe a little bit like sticky. Um, okay. So obvi obviously playing music's most fun, like when the crowd is having the best time. But, sure. you know, that's not not always the case. And maybe earlier on in your career, you, you might have experienced it probably more than you do with Lotus. But like, how how do you mentally approach those and, and just like in general handle a situation when you can just feel that, like the crowd's not as pumped as you'd like them to be. Yeah, yeah. And that that's happened a lot in my early career. Um, you know, there there have been situations where either we were opening for another band and everyone just sees you as an obstruction to the band that they want to see and they're just not into it. Um, and or we're playing and we're we're in a new market trying to trying to you know make an impression on people. And maybe the, it'll start with a hundred people in a room. And by the time we get to the third song, 25 people are left. Um, but for me, there's, there will always be at least a few people that are into what you're doing. At least you hope, you know? So even if, if you're in a room, even, even a Lotus show where people are spending a lot of money to be there, if it's on a Sunday night um, on a three day run and, and they're tired and they're ready to go home and you can kind of tell it, they'll still be, a couple hundred people there that are psyched to be there and I could see them. And, and I really try to just focus on the people that are having a good time. Um, and also I try not to be too dependent on the crowd with my playing, you know, I played in front of 30,000 people. I played in front of 30, 30 people. Um, and I, I try not to let that influence my playing too much. You know, I'm still just going to go out there, have a good time, give it my all. And, uh, and hopefully the few people that are into it will, will like it and tell their friends to come back. And next time, maybe it'll be more people there that, that are into it. But um, yeah, you know, these, these, it happens. It's, it's part of a, it's part of the gig sometimes. Yeah. You mentioned like playing in front of 30,000 people and, and we've talked about Red Rocks and, I want to I want to hear with your career and with how you approach your craft like what ultimately have you learned brings you the most fulfillment. Uh, um really more when the band is on fire 
and we're all communicating and I'm just closing my eyes, just vibing in that moment. I get the chills, you know, and I'm just like, this is just amazing. And it doesn't happen a lot. Um, it may, maybe a, once or twice a year where I really, really get that, that feeling. Um, and that's what I'm living for. And, and it's funny, I, we may have talked about this before, but even my, my preference is to play in front of a smaller crowd. I like prank, playing like 1000 to 2000 people is like my sweet spot, you know, um, something like the 930 club, um, where there's a, a, enough people to be in the room to give it energy, but it's not this like huge production. For some reason, that that's 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 my favorite over over the big shows. Um, and it's funny because when you're a kid, you always dream of playing the real big shows, and you know you want to play Madison Square Garden and all this stuff. But for me now that I don't really care that much, you know, I'm I'm, I'm psyched about the smaller shows. Um, and I was even cool with the Humphrey Show because we were all we were in Montana and Utah, so we're not playing in front of big crowds, you know, there was like 1500 cap rooms. Um, and, uh, and it was great. It was good. You know, the size of the audience was perfect for me. So, yeah. Well, Mike, man, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone out there listening, we got links in the description to Lotus website. You can, you know, find all their tour dates and keep up with everything they got going on. And yeah, Mike wrapping up here, just got a couple, couple more questions for you. Sure. What do you think old you would say to you now today? Oh, uh, wow. Um, I mean, you could really, you know, I, I guess I could extrapolate that by thinking like what I would say to like 20 year old me, you know, sort of, sort of thing. So like you're, you're talking like me at like 75, what I would say to me now, sort of. Um, I think probably remember to enjoy your health, enjoy your young kids, because th these are things that you're, you're, you're probably taking for granted at the time and they're not going to last forever. Um, you should be investing more in, uh, Roth IRAs because, uh, <laughs> retirement is coming soon. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, th things along that line that even cliche things, you know, not to not to sweat small things to really enjoy every day. Um, typical things about life. So, uh, yeah, I think typical, along that line, great, typical, typical great things that yeah. <laughs> you definitely should be doing, you know, those cliche things. <laughs> the cliches for a reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last, last one. So you've, you've got children. Let's just say hypothetically, you could have a piece of advice written and in their pocket for the rest of their life. What might you say to them? Wow. Um, do what you love, you know, do what you love, uh, to thine own self be true. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's part of what we're trying to do now. We have them in all these different activities to try to find out where where their passions lie and it's really cool to see because sometimes it's not what you think it is you know maybe i'll maybe i've been putting my kids in in music lessons and it's they're it's not for them but you know my 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 seven-year-old daughter every single night i have to like rip a book out of her hands because she'll read for four hours instead of sleeping and that's her passion you know and that's what she's going for so like let her do it you know so but but you know yeah i think i think uh find your passion and 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 really dive into that and enjoy that i think would make anyone uh pretty happy amazing yeah awesome well mike thank you so much mike greenfield follow him everywhere <laughs> check him out we've got links in the description and yeah mike any final words for uh any of your fans out there still listening yeah we have some really good shows coming up uh this fall um love to see you guys out there and uh feel free to write me messages on social media and uh yeah hopefully i can see you guys soon Hell yeah. I'm Katie Daly, producer of Flowers on the Stage. This episode is brought to you by New Belgium Brewing. 